Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Voting Village 2019 speaker track. Uh, I'm going to be yeah, woo. <laughs> I'm going to be starting off by introducing. Um, I'm, I'm Maggie McAlpine. I'm one of the co-founders of the Village. I'm going to be introducing my other co-founders, uh, Professor Matt Blaze and Harry Hursty, to give us the opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Matt? <laughs> oh. Come up. <laughs> All right, so this is the third year when we have the voting village. Every single year is a little bit different, uh, different focus. This year we have a lot of new stuff, both in as a voting machines and as a technology. But first of all, let's talk about a little bit how we got started with this. For us, this was the first year was all about buying from eBay using the secret powers of eBay to buy voting machines. The second year, we got a little bit more technology, both from government surplus websites and eBay. We started to introduce another ideas, for example, the cyber range to train election officials how to defend to do a red team, blue team exercises, and do a little bit of of helping the election officials to pair with the, vote, with the hackers to get help in, in solving their security problems. This year we are looking to expand that with the Unhack the Ballot uh, initiative where we are pairing, we do speed dating between hackers and the election officials so that you can talk with someone who might be in your neighborhood and can help you to understand the challenges and technologies. So we are evolving and we are here to educate and help and most importantly, DEF CON is not about proving, or, or the voting list is not about proving that voting machines can be hacked. They all can be hacked. And the voting machines 20 years from now, those can be hacked too. So it's all about making sure that we understand the risk. U.S. elections cannot be run without voting machines. It's too complex. But you have to introduce auditability, you have to introduce paper ballots, you have to introduce mechanisms which make certain that the right people win. Thanks. So, uh, I'm Matt Blaze. I'm one of the co-founders, uh, along with Hari and Mar Maggie and Jake, who you'll be hearing from uh, virtually uh, in a few minutes. I just want to talk for a few minutes about what we're doing here, why we're, why we're doing this, and what we hope to accomplish, and how we got here. Um, the, almost everything uh, in the voting village, uh, and uh, almost all the interest in voting, can be traced back uh, to uh, the uh, 2000 presidential election. And you may remember uh, that the uh, 2000 presidential election was very contentious. I mean, not like today, the country was very divided. Um, and uh, it was very stark. Um, and there was a disagreement about who the winner of the election was. So in addition to being a kind of uh, a division in the country between you know, ideological uh, uh, aspects of who the, you know, what the best policy should be, there was also a disagreement about the objective question of who won the election. Um, and that was partly due to the mechanism of voting used in a few counties in one state. And uh, the uh, particular mechanism in use involved um, uh, voting machines that used electricity exclusively for the light in the voting booth. There was no actual computation in the voting booth. Uh, the voter would simply fill out a little uh, punch card ballot by pressing a stylus through uh, a card uh, corresponding to their, uh, to their winner. But that technology, in spite of the fact that it didn't actually have any computers involved, had a buffer overflow in it. Uh, and the buffer overflow was that the little pieces of cardboard in the punch card would build up be behind the ballot and make it more difficult to vote for winning candidates as the day went on. And so by the end of the day, many of the senior citizens in this Florida county physically 
had difficulty punching all the way through for their candidates and didn't actually make a good hole in the card. The, elect the tabulators then had difficulty uh, figuring out what their intention was. This was the issue that united the country. We didn't agree on who the president should be, but everyone agreed that this old-fashioned voting technology needed to be replaced. And what Congress did was they allocated a giant pile of money uh, in the Help America Vote Act, uh, which very quickly passed with overwhelming bipartisan support to update the voting technology used in the states and provide funding for state and local officials to buy new machines. Um, unfortunately, we didn't know at the time how to build the better machines that the Help America Vote Act uh, mandated. And so there was a, a uh, funding for buying new machines and a deadline to buy them by, but no actual um, strong engineering foundation for how to build a better voting machine. And the uh, um, a voting machine industry kind of stepped up and did, you know, you can argue about whether it was the best that they could uh, that they could do, but certainly um, they didn't understand as much at the time as we do now about how to build uh, voting machines. And almost everything produced uh, to comply with the Help America Vote Act has had. Uh, terrible vulnerabilities associated with it that can lead us potentially to a situation not merely as bad as what happened in the 2000 election, but potentially worse, where we simply don't know who won the election. Uh, and that's partly because we are dependent, we've taken these systems that weren't dependent on software before and made them dependent on software. And as everybody in Las Vegas right now can tell you, software is utterly terrible. Um, and uh, so we essentially took a problem that was hard and we added software to it. Um, and that uh, essentially made the problem worse. Uh, unfortunately, um, we just didn't know how to do better then. Uh, in 2007, uh, Hari and I, um, uh, along with many other people, led studies sponsored by states like California and Ohio to examine uh, the voting technology that they were using. We were given privileged access to the voting machines. We were allowed to do something that everyone else wasn't allowed to do. And we examined these systems and we discovered, oh my God, these are not, not merely as bad as we feared, but far worse. Every system examined had vulnerabilities that would allow you to either um, change uh, the outcome of an election or create uncertainty about who the winner was. What do we do? Well, an unsatisfying thing to do would be to make a list of bugs and then fix them. But the problem is that list of bugs that need to be fixed is never going to be complete. Um, fortunately, over the last 10 years, we've actually been able to do better than that. Um, Ron Rivest, um, who is one of the uh, founders of Public Key Cryptography, an incredibly um, uh, prolific and important computer scientist, came up with a deceptively simple design requirement for voting systems called software independence. And the idea of software independence is very simple. It says that a voting system should be designed in a way that the outcome of the election doesn't depend on software. And if there's an undetected software failure, you can still determine who the correct winner of the election is. And that sounds like it says don't use software, but it's actually a, uh, a uh, design requirement that allows you to use software as long as you use it in a way that allows you to recover from a software failure. The good news from that is coupled with a technique to do, uh, do primarily to Philip Stark, who you'll be hearing from uh, later in our uh, speaking track, a statistician from University of California, Berkeley, called risk limiting audits. There, um, there are actually ways to use computerized, certain types of computerized voting systems uh, in ways that meet the software independence requirement. In particular, optical scan paper ballots with uh, 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 optical scan readers uh, coupled with a rigorous system of auditing the ballots by hand uh, after the election using some sampling techniques can achieve this. 
we didn't know any of this back when the Help America Vote Act was, uh, was passed. These, but these systems exist. They exist today. Um, and uh, they are, in, in fact, in use uh, in uh, many, many counties throughout the United States. Risk-limiting audits are just starting to uh, get some attention uh, and are starting to be used in different places along with the equipment that can take advantage of them, which exists. It, it, can, be, it can be purchased today. So what are we doing here? Well, one of the problems is that back in 2007, when Hari and I um, <coughs> were given privileged access to voting systems, almost nobody outside of the voting vendor community knew how voting systems worked. Uh, and one of the things that we've been able to, uh, uh, to, to achieve here, uh, uh, in no small part due to an exemption from the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, is open up the details of voting systems to everyone. Anyone who wants to come here can come into our room and um, look at the voting machines and play with them and attack them and bang on them. And in fact, uh, you know, our, our rule is feel free to break anything. Just do it in an interesting way. Uh, we've got plenty of equipment in there and we, we want you to take it apart and we want you to uh, really understand how it uh, how it works. Because, you know, in some sense, we're examining voting systems, but what we're really trying to do here is produce many, many more experts on this problem. And so I want to thank everybody for coming because I think this is one of the most pressing problems uh, in our democracy. Voting technology is a critical part of the integrity of elections and will be uh, uh, going forward um, far more than it is today. And we need people who understand how this works who aren't simply trying to sell us uh, of the voting system that they designed. Uh, we're going to be hearing a number of really exciting things uh, throughout the weekend. Um, DARPA is, uh, the Defense Research Projects Agency, is uh, <coughs> introducing here for the first time in public a secure uh, architecture that may be helpful in voting systems, along with some uh, demonstration applications of voting systems built on top of it um, that, uh, that you'll be seeing uh, in the uh, room, as well as uh, older systems. We'll be hearing from election officials about the problems that they have in actually running um, uh, election systems. Uh, we'll be hearing from journalists about the uh, difficulty of reporting on a really complex set of problems that have very important impact uh, to our society. All of these pieces interact with each other. And uh, one of the things that we're very proud of and very excited about is that we're bringing together not just technologists, but the users of the technology and uh, the, uh, the people uh, who uh, are depending on its outcome. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, please uh, stick around. Please break things. And uh, let me give it back to Harry for a few moments, and then we'll hear from Jake. Oh, I thought, well, let's have a Jake to. OK, if you don't want to talk, yeah. talk. No, no, I will talk after Jake. So. So Village co-founder Jake Braun could not be here today, but he sends you his best via recorded uh, video from the com coming from the Iowa <laughs> State Fair. <laughs> like the 2020 election will at the very least be more secure than the 2016 election. And again, that's, that's due in large part to a lot of the great work all of you have done. Um, and I think that the fact that this is only four months away should hopefully encourage all of you to work even harder this DEF CON to identify more vulnerabilities and potential solutions um, that policymakers can implement to make the 2020 election more secure than the 2016 election uh, was. Uh, I also want to thank um, 
uh, the Dark Tangent for having having us here again uh, at the Voting Village. Obviously, I want to deeply thank my co-founders, Matt Blaze, Hari Hursty, and Maggie McAlpine, and then all the volunteers and staff who made this possible and worked for months and hours and hours and months and months on this, including Mary Hanley, Phil, Phil Stupak, Morgan Ryan, Annalise Wagner, uh, Caroline Immel, um, and a host of others. I know I forgot dozens of you, but but anyway, uh, thanks so much to all of you. Um, and so I guess, you know, what what are we thanking everybody for here? Well, I, you know, I, I think we've accomplished a lot in two years. Um, you know, as, as many of you know, we were asked for, we believe it was the first time that uh, DEF CON hackers were asked to come to the, to the Capitol and, and release their findings um, on election security uh, issues that we identified. Those things incur included things like uh, the fact that remote hacking is possible, um, of not just things like websites, but also databases and um, even some voting machines. Uh, we found that despite people saying that uh, no one would ever notice somebody hacking or that, that we would definitely know if somebody was hacking a machine, we figured out that somebody could hack a voting machine in two minutes, despite the fact that it takes the average person six minutes to vote. Uh, we found out that um, unfortunately, even uh, vulnerabilities that are identified to the responsible parties can go unfixed, sometimes over, uh, over a decade. Uh, we found vulnerabilities last year that were disclosed a decade ago and had yet to be fixed. We also found out uh, from the Mueller report, uh, uh, reinforced a lot of what uh, we identified last year, which was that uh, you, know, you can hack a, a website with a SQL injection and get into a voter registration database, which is exactly what Mueller said the Russians did last year, or in 2016, and, and frankly didn't even go far as what we were saying was possible uh, last year. So with all that, I think the one thing that continues to stick out in my mind was something that Hari kind of quote unquote found, which was uh, he opened up the, the first machine, opened up the back of the first machine, and realized what we all would assume was true, but nobody had known until we did this publicly, which was that most, if not all, the parts are made in other countries, uh, many of whom are unfriendly to democracy itself. And so, you know, that and none of and these other findings uh, had never been known before, but because this is the first and only public third party uh, assessment, although Matt doesn't like that word, um, tinkering with machines that is done in the, in the world, um, this is the, no one would know any of these things if it wasn't for us doing this here at DEF CON. Um, so that's kind of what we have done. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, we've got a lot of great stuff coming up this year. Um, DARPA's here, which we're really excited about. Um, we love the fact that uh, folks, especially as reputable as DARPA, are coming to have their uh, technology tinkered with and kind of beat on um, over the weekend by our guys and gals um, here. We also... Uh, are excited to have what we believe is the first ever um, attempt to kind of match up folks, hackers and security folks with election officials directly so that uh, hackers can try and provide free of charge their services to help election officials secure their elections. If there's one thing that we all know is true is that there's not enough people in the cybersecurity world to fill all the jobs and no, nowhere else is that more true than in the election industry. And so we really appreciate the brave election officials who came out here, uh, despite you know not knowing how the media and others may react, to sit there and, and talk to hackers about how uh, the folks at this con or conference can provide uh, free help on how to secure uh, their their systems and networks. So uh, thank you to all the election officials who came out, and I'll thank in advance all the uh, very civic-minded hackers and, and other researchers here who I'm sure will be offering up their services to help secure these networks. Um, third, we're partnering with the AI Village again. We're really, or not again, we're for the first time partnering with the AI Village uh, to talk about or to better understand deep fakes and things like that and how they can affect our elections. We're partnering again uh, with Roots to help get kids more in, in, involved in elections and cybersecurity issues. So we're super excited about all the kids that are going to be involved in, in thinking about election security this year. We've got way more machines than we have in the past, so we're really excited to, to look for new vulnerabilities and, 
and uh, and let folks know about them so that they can be fixed. And uh, oh, and then we've also got three days of speakers this year. Uh, way more election officials, federal officials, and and especially members of Congress. We really want to thank Senator Wyden and the other members of Congress who are coming here to speak. You know, you guys and gals have to go back and do the hard work of passing legislation um, to address all the the vulnerabilities uh, that we find here. And so, you know, we thank you all for taking depth. Con seriously, and more importantly, taking election security so seriously. So thank all of you uh, uh, election officials for coming out this year. Um, and oh, so with that, I guess my final thing I want to say is um, I want to shamelessly plug my book, which is for the first time uh, on sale <laughs> here today um, at DEF CON. And it's the story of kind of us. It's the story of all of you and, and a little bit of my early life in the campaign world and so on. But then later goes into how DEF CON Voting Village started, all kind of some of the behind the scenes uh, drama that went on and getting the machines and all the pushback we got from various players and 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 then also I, I at least try and really kind of celebrate what you all did and and how amazing it was uh, that the, the folks that are are part of this conference and have been from the beginning you know, found so many vulnerabilities. I go, I tell a long story about Hari that's deeply interesting, um, and I think you all would find it quite entertaining as well. And uh, and then ends, I hope, on a positive note to talk about how, you know, maybe all this, while stressful and not great, may lead us to a better future where elections are more secure for democracies all over the world because of what we've gone through for the past couple of years. And, and so hopefully you guys will buy it, and hopefully you'll buy one for a friend, and it'll make a great uh, stocking stuffer or holiday gift at the end of the year. And um, uh, so thanks, everybody. Have a great DEF CON. Please buy my book, and uh, go secure our elections. Thank you. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is what DEF CON is and what Voting Village is as who we are and how this came to be. I think Matt will absolutely agree with me that for my feeling when I come to DEF CON, it's not to come to conference. This is a meeting of extended family. Dysfunctional family sometimes, but family nevertheless. Uh, we don't agree on any, almost anything, but we understand what is important and we work towards common goals to secure things which are important, whether it's a infrastructure, critical infrastructure, elections, uh, medical equipment, airplanes, cars, all kind of things. This is all a community effort. Voting Village doesn't have corporate sponsors. We are non-profit. That's how we literally, uh, Matt is, is, is big help. We have Verified Voting, who is big help. We have Ele Election Integrity Foundation, which is big help. But this is a non-profit operation. Everything you see as in a village has been purchased with pennies. We don't have big funding. But this is important. This is not an issue of partisanship. And this is not even an issue about United States. We have a global community of democratic countries, and all the countries have right now facing similar threats to their democracy. The threats come from various of different angles. If we look what is what has been published about 2016 election, one thing which is interesting is that even when we have published a lot of vulnerabilities in voting machines, it seems to be that the attacks were targeting the backend systems and backend networks. Very old fashioned, very traditional attacks. Nothing new, nothing fancy. Actually, I would argue that when you look at uh, the phishing attack done by, allegedly by, by uh, hackers working for a certain foreign state, it was a reused malware, repurposed malware, recycled. It was very low tech and yet effective. We have a lot of work to do. 
in various areas in order to secure the elections. Also, while voting machine hacking village um, is considering a voting machine, we have to understand the election technology is really wide. You have a, in the United States, you have a voter registration systems, which feed in the electronic poll book systems. Then you have the tabulation of the votes, and in the end, you have the reporting of the votes. Each part of this link, if it's compromised, will cause a havoc, will undermine the trust to the system. We have had our threat model wrong for various of reasons. When Matt and I started, at that time, the threat model, which everybody was thinking, was a dishonest candidate trying to win. Nobody was paying attention into attackers with other motivations, like nation states. Nation state necessarily doesn't care who wins. They might have someone who they prefer, but they are not ever supporting something for the kindness of their heart. If you look at a nation state attackers who don't who are not democratic countries themselves, this is an ideological warfare. This is a psyops, and the end game is undermine the trust of the people to the system the people are living in. <coughs> so this is all about also rebuilding the trust into the process and maintaining the trust that democratic system is the way to govern, self-govern a population. Again, this comes back to the community. When we look at the hacker community, we have a different day jobs. We have different places where we, we do our influence. And when we look at the large population, there's a lot of people who are looking for how they can help. Voter apathy is as dangerous to the democracy as an attack to democracy. One key element here is we are improving this. No matter what you see and what you look, that, that should never discourage you to vote. Because democracy is all about participation in the, in the society and participation in the community. If you really care, become a poll worker. Help that way. We have in all the democratic countries the similar problem that the average age of poll workers seems to be going up about one year every year. Unfortunately, having people who have a security background and a poll worker helping people to vote, seeing that everything goes smoothly, if you see something, say something, very important. And I said, these, these problems we are facing in the United States are not unique to the United States. If you look at the news, uh, in, in England, in, in France, in Germany, in Austria, you see a fragments of the same problem manifesting a little bit different way, but across the Western Hemisphere and democratic countries. And also, not to mention, you know, we, we had a, there was a, a significant amount of turmoil in, in Indonesia uh, with uh, their election and, and dispute about the winners. So these problems need to be solved. And there's no easy way of solving them. These are hard problems. And I would like to also say something about where we are in technology. As I said, we both believe in paper ballots. We are far from neutralized because we are hackers. We really, really love technology. But there are a lot of proposals out there which are seemingly having a technological solution problem where we don't have a technology for it. For example, I would like to say, just simply, blockchain is not the solution for this area. It cannot be used. There's actually a lot of papers which explain why blockchain cannot be used in secret ballot public elections. There are a lot of other proposals how an irresponsible way of technology could solve the problem. One, a lot of the uh, Western countries, for example, in Germany, uh, have a law which requires that how the votes are cast and tallied has to be understandable for a common person with no special skills or tools. Software, when it's designed the right way, 
is something you can explain. Uh, I don't remember who exactly was uh, who's quoted is that there's two ways of writing software which doesn't have obvious flaws. Another one it is simple, clear, and it obviously doesn't have flaw. Other one it is extremely complex and obfuscated, and you cannot find obvious flaws. Obviously, another one of these is better idea. But anyway, that's uh, uh, what I want to say is to make everybody to understand we are in this situation together, uh, whether regardless. Where, which democratic country you come from. We need to try to figure out from all the areas where, how to solve that problem area, how to make the confidence to, to stay up, people to, keep, to understand this is the way we want to self-govern, and make certain that whatever we can do, we do that together as a community. So Thanks, Harry. So I just want to uh, end on a, a, a Two notes. One is how hard this problem is. That in the United States, in particular, we have uh, arguably the most complex ballots in the world. Uh, we have we vote on more things. Um, we have more different ballots that different people get. Um, it's, elections are extraordinarily complicated. Um, the authority to run elections is, is quite decentralized. The federal government has a very limited role. The standards are broadly set by states. Elections are run uh, in almost every state by individual counties um, who are responsible for buying and managing the uh, election equipment as well as running the very complex logistics of elections. And often um, the funding for elections is competing with things like road repairs and, and fire departments and things like that. Uh, and uh, you know, counties that are strapped for budgets uh, don't have unlimited budgets without significant external funding to uh, fund their elections. And they often lack the very specialized expertise to protect that infrastructure, particularly as we understand state actors as being the threat, not just dishonest politicians. So it's one thing to think, you know, is the U.S. National Security Agency uh, a worthy adversary for the uh, Russian GRU? Um, but, you know, ask if your local county registrar of voters is able to defend against, you know, the Russian or Chinese military intelligence service. Uh, it's a fundamentally unfair fight. Um, so it's an extraordinarily difficult problem. Um, and it's a difficult problem that adds to that all of the political rancor that uh, uh, U.S. elections have associated with them, even in the best of times. And, but I want to end, though, on a note saying that I've been working in this area for about two decades. And over the last few years, I've actually been more optimistic that we are in a position to make progress uh, than I ever have been. I am optimistic that this is a problem that is within our grasp uh, to solve. There is finally um, the uh, background to make voting an engineering discipline. We know what the requirements are for robust voting systems. Uh, we didn't used to know that. But also, we're in a position where, although we disagree on the next step for making progress quite often, and you know, there's all sorts of deadlock, there is, in fact, bipartisan agreement that, uh, at least in principle, this is an important problem. Um, and uh, that's actually fairly new. After the first voting village, I uh, testified uh, uh, in the House in 2017 uh, on the results of the voting system. Um, we were uh, invited uh, by, uh, at that time, the majority, uh, the Republican Party. Uh, Will Hurd uh, invited me uh, to testify. Uh, that would have been unheard of a few years ago. Voting security was regarded as a partisan issue. It's much less so. Uh, now than it has been. So we have this combination of the technology um, uh, background as well as a kind of social consensus that this is worth solving like we never have before. So what I want to say is this is a great time to be interested in this. You get to be, uh, you get to be part of the success. You get to be part of, 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 of fixing this because I'm actually confident that within our lifetimes, unless I'm struck down as I fall off the stage, um, uh, this is a problem that, uh, that, that we are going to be solved. And I want to echo what Hari said. Um, one of the things you can do when you leave here uh, is call your local uh, elections office and 
sign up to volunteer as a poll worker in the next election. You'll learn an enormous amount, and you'll make incredibly valuable uh, relationships. So thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, let me uh, turn it back to Hari, who's going to keep talking. Yeah, just a few minutes, a moment. See, I, I think Matt, what, uh, I'm, I make the joke saying that election environment has changed so quickly that a lot of people think there's an election office which have an IT department, but really it should be IT department which happens to run elections. Uh, the village is open. Uh, we will have a short introductory of all the machines in the uh, village slightly after 11. We will have a, in a village scribes who are this documenting every finding we are going to do. So we are going to publish, as every other year, a, uh, a short uh, presentation of all the findings and report what, what we had, what happened in the village during these days. Matt and I are going to be all times there. Just come, whatever you, if you have questions, don't hesitate to approach and, and ask us anything. And uh, we will be all time until, until Sunday in the village. So come and join us. Thank you very much for coming.